I'm Adrian Tan, and this is my podcast where I deep dive into matters surrounding HR tech and the future of work. I was a former HR serial entrepreneur and write extensively about the future of work on my blog. You may know me better through the Singapore HR tech market map that I created in 2017. In this podcast, I speak with the people who are enabling the future of work. From mindfulness coach to employee engagement platform, they are all helping companies to better navigate rising work and business demands. I'm hoping that sharing in this podcast will help you better prepare yourself and your business for what the future of work may bring. Hey, Derek, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Hey, Adrian. Thanks for having me on the show. You're most welcome. Uh, To begin with, could you help the audience understand a bit about your background, the chain of events that lead you to where you are today and the problem you're trying to solve? For me, currently, I'm the uh, director of the Go Digital Enterprise Solutions with uh, Beepo Services. Yeah, so I'm located in Singapore. So we help companies to digitalize the HR functions and as well as process the payroll outsourcing services for clients. Yeah, so I've joined uh, people since last year. Prior to that, I was a internal uh, HR IS person supporting a lot of organization. Yeah, so I help companies to digitalize and transform the current business processes. And I also help to uh, set roadmaps for the companies to ensure that uh, they have a proper HR transformation within the organization. Yeah, after having uh, so much experience in terms of the internal organization workings and having uh, worked with a lot of uh, HR uh, professionals. Yeah, so here I am with people to really look at how can we uh, bring the latest technology in terms of uh, HR technology, in terms of the latest AI machine learning technology into the HR tech world. Yeah, and offering that as a services for our organization and clients. You're probably the first person from, or rather with hefty HRIS background that I've had on <laughs> yes. my podcast. So you make, for, you make for a very interesting discussion. But I do yeah. understand when you first started in your career, you actually was in uh, software development before, mm-hmm. of course, going, to, going through a chain of events to lead you to what you're doing right now with people. Yes. What yes. was the trigger moment from IT, more of a back-end kind of thing to to more of the HR stuff? I was beginning with, to, I was, uh, with IRAS as a software developer. Yeah, so I started off uh, coding of uh, the IRAS program in the uh, in the local Singapore tax firm. Yeah, so from there, I picked up uh, quite a bit of technology. And also over the years, I got the opportunity to uh, join uh, Hewlett Packard. Yeah, that's where a, this, this software called uh, PeopleSoft, which is the which is the leading ERP software at that time, came into picture. And of course, HP provided a uh, very intensive training uh, for us to learn about the HR as well as the, the software and also the ways to process the payroll. Yeah. And from there, I went on to implement about five countries uh, using the PeopleSoft Global Payroll. Yeah. And that's where I found that actually software can help to process the day-to-day operation activities for clients. Yeah. That's where I got more interested into the HR world okay, because uh, HR is not only about payroll. Uh, it's about the end-to-end processing okay, from the point where by we do the recruiting to the point we do the onboarding until the point where the person go through the performance appraisal and compensation and of course the offboarding. Yeah. So there's really a lot of aspect in terms of HR. Uh, which I felt that is more interest to me. Yeah. So that's why I, so my few years experience is more uh, towards sales with the organization as well as also supporting clients and also organization as a consultant. So what we have right now in terms of auto inclusion at IRAS, you have your fingerprints over them. La. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So Thank if you, you so see much the... to make it easier for <laughs> so many of us. Yeah, it's, it's really the, the pioneer. I'm quite fortunate to be in the pioneer team to develop the auto inclusion program. Yeah. So that's where I learned about a lot regarding the salary processing. Yeah. And of course, all the components of the salary as well. And based on your uh, background, you have seen, of course, people soft, you have seen enterprise uh, software. You have also worked with some of the softwares or maybe have seen some of the software that are targeted at the mid tier or maybe even for SME. Based on your visual of what you're seeing so far, what are typically some of the key essence that differentiate perhaps enterprise software, especially between a, a tier one and a tier two providers? Yeah. Okay. I think this is a very good question. I've been working with uh, Oracle products for, I think almost about 20 years. Yeah. And that is considered as a tier one products. Uh, along the way, I've also worked on other products, for example, SAP SuccessFactors. 
Yeah. And, and more recently, uh, for the past few years, I've been also looking at uh, some of the local softwares. Yeah. What I have observed is that uh, for the tier one software out there, typically they are serving the global market. Yeah. So for, for example, let's say a, a multinational company uh, that wants to have a HR system. So typically they will just go for a tier one solution that covers all the different countries and different regions. Yeah. But I think sometimes we have to do a lot of uh, customization to the product okay, because uh, some of the localization okay, require a lot more tweaking and also a lot of, of changing in the requirements to fit the localization efforts. Yeah. But when MNC want to deploy a tier one product, more often you'll find that while well, there is a lot of, first of all, there's a lot of uh, localization to change the software. And also, uh, secondly, they would spend a lot of time and effort to align. Sometimes they may say that, oh, certain things you cannot uh, customize and you have to follow the, the standard way of doing things. Yeah, which may not be more efficient. Yeah. So end of the day, you have a tier one solution, okay, but you do not uh, really meet the localized requirement or statutory requirement. And sometimes I also find that uh, certain local statutory requirements are not fast enough to meet the, that means when it comes to software itself, it's not fast enough to be developed and offer to the client. Yeah. And this causes uh, quite a bit of frustration as well. Yeah. So I guess it also depends very much mm -hmm. on whether the vendor has uh, sufficient interest to really help localize. I, I would imagine yep. for global player with say, I don't know, maybe Europe as their main market, Singapore mm -hmm. is just one small little dot. How much money yeah. can you make from Singapore? <laughs> yeah, that's true. And why do you want to spend so much money on developing things that is unique just for Singapore market? Yeah. That, that's where the, the company will then find a local vendor in let's say Singapore or Malaysia to help to extend the functionality in terms of the features in the tier one product. And on this note of tier one, tier two, or even more tiers beyond that, who actually decide who is tier one and tier two? Or is there a technical definition of who should be in all these different tiers? Is it just because, oh, you have global presence, you're tier one. Is that the simplistic way to segregate I them? Yeah, I think the more simplest way is the, that if they are serving a global customers or uh, global presence, then that's considered as a tier one application. Yeah, when it comes to uh, tier two, it's mainly serving the uh, mini the SMEs and also some of the MSCs as well. But to be very strict is that for most uh, multinational companies, they would choose tier one product because it serves the global presence in, in nature. Yeah. So say, for example, the company I have is HP. Yeah, HP have moved from PeopleSoft, which is the global tier one product. And now I think now they are with uh, Workday. Yeah, Workday a tier one product. Yeah. Maybe in the future, if I were to start a HRMS company, I would just call myself tier one, company <laughs> named tier one. <laughs> so people will automatically think that I'm tier one. But back to our conversation, uh, given that you have implemented and worked on so many different HRMS, especially in the implementation phase, I'm very certain you have seen many instances where things did not go so well, some issues, pitfall, lesson learnings. And for mm. our audience out there, may, some of them might really be looking out right now and do not really have a clue on mm. the things to watch out for. As someone who has been there, done that, are there certain things that you can condense and share with them, things that they should take note of to ensure that their implementation is as smooth as possible? Yeah, sure. So I was a, with a consulting firm for about five years. And back then I've uh, helped a company, for example, one of the company is actually an educational provider. Let me see, is in the education space. Yeah. So from that, so the whole project is quite fast. We managed to implement the whole project end to end within uh, three months. Yeah. And that's for employee size of maybe about 200 employees. So something that I realized is that companies, they would want to implement a HRI software. So typically they will be very clueless on where to start. Yeah. Some companies, they would provide a very lengthy requirement study. Yeah. So some of them, they may not have anything. It means black, totally blank, no, no requirement. So that's where we as a project manager consult, we would step in and do uh, a lot of workshops uh, with the client. Yeah. And of course, this will take time, maybe about one month or so. Yeah, but through, through that experience, uh, we found that, well, a lot of times certain processes are very, I would say very manual. Yeah. And sometimes when they try to adjust to the new way of doing things, you may see that there's quite a resistance to change. Yeah. 
And sometimes uh, we have to spend a lot of time to convince the, the, the employees and also the stakeholders to see, to tell them that, you know, what are the benefits of changing it to the new way of doing things? Yeah, that's where we spend a lot of time in that area. And subsequently, when we deploy the system itself, I also realized that there's really, I, I think the most impo- important factor is that to be able to communicate the changes or the change management process to the employee okay, at different levels so that the employees knows what to expect on the system or the new processes. I think change management is really key in terms of deploying a very successful case. Yeah, for just now I mentioned the uh, the case where we have uh, implemented within three months for that for that company is is really very fast because we have a very effective uh, change management process coming down from the client and together with us consultant we went hand in hand together to to do a very thorough change management process for the employee. Yeah, in the end I think it's quite uh, useful in that sense. Yeah. So would you attribute most of the delays in HRS implementation down to the change management process where communication were not sufficiently done? And of course, because of that, things just keep dragging on and on. Yeah, sometimes the delay, most of the time is inadequate requirements. There means not enough time that to, to study the actual requirement itself. Yeah. Uh, reason is because some of the employees that we engage with feel, felt that they are not ready to for the change okay, because they don't see the benefit of the change. Yeah. So they might be doing the manual processes for many years and, and they don't, they don't want to let go. Yeah. So that's where this will surface out. And of course, uh, if they want to stick with the manual processes, this will cause certain uh, delay in terms of providing a good uh, requirement study. Yeah. And the end, it causes a gap in terms of the requirement. And, and sometimes it may potentially cause uh, a delay in terms of the project. Yeah. And sometimes I also realize that broad HIS implementation, okay, would definitely, you need have to involve all the different levels of stakeholders uh, who are actually using the system itself or operating the system. I think this is very important, okay, because if you don't get all the stakeholders to be aligned, that definitely is not going to be a successful project. And then obviously it's one of the key challenges. Huh? Like you mentioned earlier on, not everyone will see eye to eye or maybe place the same amount of importance on mm. why this project has to kick off. But maybe for anchoring purpose, you can help us to understand for an average project. Okay, you mentioned about the three months for the education company. And it's, how many headcount do they have? They have about 200 employees. 200, okay. Yeah. So let's bring up a number. So assuming I'm looking at a 1,000 headcount company, mm. uh, more more at the lower end of an enterprise side, I would yep. say. I know there's a lot of assumption in place, but what do yes. you think would be a reasonable implementation cycle? From I think 1,000 uh, 1, end to end, I think should be, uh, depending on the module size, if uh, if the company has got maybe end to end modules, including payroll, I'll say 1,000 size will be between three months to about five months kind of range for the end to end implementation. I see. So there'll yeah. be a right anchor. La. Anything beyond, obviously, things will uh, really be coming into play to drag things down. Yeah. And I also understand from your past experience uh, that in, in the, the old ways, of course, doing things since the evolution of all these HRMS, things have mm. really progressed a fair bit. And I yes. understand you, you actually schooled me on this previously in our pre-call that the traditional pay runs actually can take forever. Why is that the case and how has that progressed or evolved since then? Uh, for this payroll run itself. So I've been doing payroll for the past 20 years and I've seen the statutory calculation for different countries. In fact, I think payroll run uh, seems to be a very simple uh, process to maybe outsider. Okay, but internally for payroll processes is a lot more complex than it is. Okay, first of all, it has, it has to be compliant with the statutory requirements uh, and also it has to be precise. Okay, that means any sense differences you cannot tolerate the differences in that. Yeah. And of course, thirdly, you also need to make sure that the money calculation is also fast and efficient. Yeah. For just give you an example, one of the company that I work, I work with happens to be on a uh, PeopleSoft payroll. Yeah. And we know that PeopleSoft is a very, has a very old uh, engine, okay, running on Cobo. Yeah. And for that company, we actually have to be on standby every uh, first first day of the month because we know that the payroll will, will run at least eight hours. Eight hours eight for hours. a few runs. Yes, eight hours. <laughs> so you can run yeah. it and then go for a long lunch, go for a movie, then come back. <laughs> yeah, so typically they will run it uh, at 9 p.m. 
And of course, they would go to bed, you know, and then maybe wake up about 5 a.m. to check that for the run. Yeah, but sometimes, sometimes the cobalt program may run into error. Yeah, so sometimes at the, about 1 a.m., we may get certain calls and say that, oh, the PO run actually run into error. Yeah, so then that's where we get activated to, to resolve the issue for them. Quick question. Yeah. So at the end of eight hours, assuming got error, does it mean where you have to rerun another eight hours? Uh, yes, you have to cancel it first and you have to identify which is the employee causing the error. Yeah. And then oh, after that's that- painful. You, That's so painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to you know, readjust the, the staff and then recalculate again. And this will take another eight hours or so, provided there's no uh, other subsequent issues. Yeah. So the maximum amount that I've, I've uh, seen uh, is the three causative day running into error. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and how has that evolved to what it is today uh, for people who may not be familiar? Are you still looking at eight hours, eight minutes or even shorter right now? Nowadays with the latest uh, processing coatings and also advanced uh, technology out there, nowadays uh, for a size of 10,000 employees, I think you can process it within 10 minutes. Yeah, this is a very standard way of the payroll processing in a software. Yeah, say for example, um, currently before HRMS, our payroll processing for about 10,000. The last check I have is about fifth, one, one, five minutes with all the overtime attendance processing. Yeah. So this is a really quite, quite a good achievement in terms of the payroll processing. And, and you can really save a lot of time as well as manpower. Now, yeah. given that payroll solution has reached a level of sophistication right now mm -hmm. and still there are a lot of new vendors coming into play maybe not so much in your space like, more towards yeah. the SME side what would be the key motivation for companies to consider changing that because I always mm -hmm. imagine and I've done payroll during my earlier days when I was running my recruitment business payroll is payroll like, it's just how sucky the UI is or the mm -hmm. UX is but it still gets the job done if you're already at this 10 minutes mark what will motivate someone to consider moving to another payroll software? In the usual SMEs environment or even any company, so usually they would have maybe one person or two person to, to process the payroll on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, you don't expect the person would prepare the payment for the company, for all, all, all the employees, and also maybe do some checking here and then and things like that. I think nowadays we have, since payroll is, is very statutory basis and also requires speed, right? Yeah. So I will guess one of the latest trend in the market is that a lot of companies are moving towards a payroll outsourcing model. Yeah. Which means to say that the whole processes of uh, processing the whole payroll for the company is being outsourced to a third party vendor. And the third party vendor just help you to check, help you to verify and help you to process the employees. And uh, they will just uh, send you the final report for you to check. And of course, the uh, payment will be made through the third party vendor system as well. Yeah. So I see there's, there's trend in that area going to it all. So and in your space, of course, so many top notch tier one companies that are out there and also have been in this space in my previous role where a lot of companies, especially in Singapore context, the larger ones would always have a tendency to pick like what we discussed, like the tier one, but almost also specifically very big brand name, the Workday, the Oracle, the success factor. And it, it, it doesn't seem to be a situation where these companies would actually consider any other alternative. In your opinion, why would they always just look at all these things? Is it a brand thing is like the IBM server when it comes to IT people buy IBM server because if breakdown mm. is IBM not my job on the line yeah. is there such a tendency based on your observation through my through my uh, past few experience with organization I felt that the especially the management level would have a tendency to swing toward a certain product yeah reason is because uh, I think in the HR industry on the top level CHRO level I think they, they already have a community in place okay, where they will share uh, information around. Yeah. So sometimes uh, due to peer sharing and all these things, they may uh, get influenced by having to select a certain brand. Okay. So that's where the, the terms of uh, Workday and also Oracle come into place. I think we all know that Workday, Workday is actually from PeopleSoft. Yeah. In the old days, PeopleSoft is I mean, the founder for PeopleSoft actually developed the Workday. Yeah. So actually Workday is very fast and growing. And also I think the branding in what Workday has done, right, has the appeal to, to state that is really very high end and also very uh, advanced in terms of the technology. Yeah. And I, I think some, 
of the C sharp O level, right, will tend to swing towards uh, the software because of the branding purposes. And sometimes I also realize that sometimes they just look at the software as a whole, but they don't really understand the day to day operation in terms of uh, what the employees or what the HR wants to have in the system itself. Yeah. End of day is there's, there's always a mismatch in terms of uh, what the organization wants and uh, what HR wants, wants to have. Yeah, because HR is all about operation and supporting the employee in terms of day-to-day activities. Yeah. But would this situation still be prevalent given how we may have progressed, how people may be a bit more enlightened or more woke in some, mm. to some extent? There's still a complete fixation on just branded. I, I see the market that I think nowadays with, with this uh, tier one software being out there and also realize that there's some companies who have implemented uh, Workday have, or maybe Oracle, right, T1 product. I also see a trend whereby they are switching to another localized uh, software. Okay, because we all know that Workday does not support payroll, is not for Asia Pacific context. Uh, Workday does not support the payroll processing for most of countries. Yeah, so then these companies will then switch towards a more localized software for the local countries, whereas the uh, Workday itself okay, becomes a more towards the employee corp. Yeah. And of course, the payroll processing will be done by the local vendor. Yeah. So I, I see that as a trend uh, that's happening quite quite recently okay, in the last, the last few months. Interesting. And I do understand as well from our previous brief call, uh, when it comes to HRIS, you personally found a use case, which also quite fascinated myself when it comes mm. to retrenchment. That yes. HRIS is actually something useful during that kind of uh, situation as well. Could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, sure. I, I guess retrenchment is something that would not really uh, happen. It's not, you wouldn't en- 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 uh, encounter that unless it's a very severe kind of situation. Yeah. So for me, in my recent employment with a local hospitality industry company, so I was part of the uh, retrenchment exercise okay, where we as we as a HRIS uh, team, we have to ensure okay, that a proper employment record is being generated out and served to the, to the individual employee. Okay, reason is because I think during a retrenchment exercise, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, calculation in terms of the benefits, in terms of the payroll, and also in terms of how much they'll be getting as part of a severance packages. Yeah, and any of these amount cannot be, cannot be off totally. Yeah. So this part, so our, us as HRIS will come, we will help to make sure that the data are calculated properly and also the generation of the details into a separate packages or hard copy information is properly handed out to the individual employee. But also bear in mind that as each of them is very complex and so it's very individualized. So a lot of checking would involve a lot of, a lot of system uh, checking. And also uh, making sure that details inside the letter are correctly being displayed okay, in, the, in the letter. Yeah. But of course, after we have helped to digitalize the whole process in terms of the generation of these, these letters, we also need to make sure that the proper information okay, in terms of the individual job titles are properly being captured and sent to the, the, there's actually a team that help to make sure they'll follow up and make sure that they can find a, a suitable position for them after they have left the company. Yeah. So this part, uh, because of the nature of the follow-ups, we have to ensure that every single person uh, has got the correct title. Okay. If not, they'll be tagged to the wrong kind of uh, position later on. Yeah. And of course, after the employee has received the letters, right? Okay. We also need to make sure we have the appropriate digital technology to, to, to have all this information or base clip information to be sent to the individual personal email. Okay. So that they would know uh, how much they are getting and when they will be paid. Yeah. So this is something that, that we have uh, put together in a very short time span, maybe about, about one, one and a half months. That means we managed to put everything together without having a, a proper solution in place. Yeah. And you joined Bipo during the height of COVID-19 and obviously COVID-19 has uh, really thrown a spana and a kitchen sink to what we're all trying to achieve. How has the experience changed the way things are being done, your opinions or your perspective on certain things or even any program offerings that may come along? Yeah. So in the, I think with the recent pandemic, a lot of employees are working from home. Yeah, and also the I also see that when a company uh, hires a new employee, for example, 
I think the first thing is that uh, with all the employees working from home, the challenge will be how do you make sure that the employee gets on properly on the first day? Okay, or even before, before onboarding, how do you ensure that the new hires get all the relevant information prior to the day one of joining? Because you could still, pre-COVID situation, you can still meet up with the applicant. Uh, you can still make sure that the person has received all the packages as required. Yeah, and also, of course, the day one, you get a nice gift, right? All the notebooks and all these things. Yeah, but I think with the with the pandemic that's happening now, I see there's really importance in terms of having a, I'll say, very complete pre-boarding, onboarding and off-boarding kind of solution. Yeah, that can help the organization to process or, or to process the individual employee seamlessly. Yeah, say for example, during the pre boarding I would imagine that with advanced solution, we could potentially generate the offer letter via the system. And of course, a route for individual approvals okay, before letting the employee okay, to sign, to digitally sign on the contract itself. Okay, and of course, this will get uh, filed into the electronic system itself. And also a copy will be sent to the employee. Yeah, and of course, uh, subsequently, the onboarding solution can also help to schedule uh, a day one activity. Okay, in terms of the videos, in terms of the, the company information or in terms of policies. Yeah, so that the employee can read upfront, okay, via the electronic way, okay, prior to joining a company. Okay, and of course, during day one, when a company, when an employee joins the company, the, the HR can send all the equipment to the employee's home. And of course, subsequently, the onboarding solution can help to assist the new employees along the way, okay, after the day one and beyond. Yeah, let's say scheduling for the uh, induction training via the online mode and also scheduling some of the important department-related training programs okay, that is suitable for the individual. Yeah. And of course, the onboarding solution should carry on. And of course, alongside with that, I would guess the main trend is also having a, a good system that can help you to, uh, to get feedback. Okay, so uh, something like a chatbot or something like that, they can help the new employees to get information as and when that they require. Yeah. And if the company, if the... um employee wants to discuss things with HR or who to look out for, then this is where they can go to the company directory or seek help from uh, other channels okay, in the system itself. Yeah. And I, I see that this kind of solution or digital solution will be very useful for, a, for any organization in times of this pandemic because this would really help them to really assist them in the day-to-day -day activities. For sure, currently with everything being remote you definitely require all this hand holding and guiding as much as possible delivered to you and of course right now the best way to doing so is through digital means so derek thank you so much today on coming onto the show to share with us more about hris implementation your experience in this space as well as some of the things that we should take note of when it comes to our implementation yeah thank you adrian for inviting me thank you so much Thank you for listening to the podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to more information about our guests and their businesses. If you enjoyed this podcast, it would be helpful to give a review on iTunes or follow me on Spotify. If you're using Overcast, please hit the star button under the episode. That will help get this episode and podcast out to more people who may find it useful. I'll see you in the next episode of The Agent Han Show.